I'd like to welcome everybody to Gardening Green Expo 2024. The sponsors of the expo are the NSRWA, the WaterSmart Program, and Kennedy's Country Gardens. Now, I wanted to let you know uh, before we get started that we are going to have a Q&A session at the end. So, if, so now I would like to introduce Susan Lee Anthony. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, tonight, um, you know, I've done this a few times, and um, tonight, rather than focus too much on native plants, which I know is like, that's kind of what we do, right? Um, but what I'm, what I'm, I'm going to certainly bring some of those into the mix. Um, but something I thought people don't really talk about too much is, um, um, cause I'm a generalist in terms of plants and I have a real focus on, um, you know, ornamental plants and making beautiful gardens cause I'm a designer and perennials. And so what I want to focus on is what, how do we make a garden that suits us, um, whether it be something very contemporary and simple um, or something very sort of formal English garden or um, country cottage garden, um, which I know a lot of people really like. And how do we do that and still um, be careful about the amount of water we use? Um, so there are tons and tons, and I believe me, I didn't cover everything, um, but tons and tons of plants that fit into that category. Um, and um, so that's mostly what I'm going to talk about, and uh, I'm going to run the gamut with it. Um, so um, I'm going to start with my first slide here. <clears throat> um, achieving a beautiful and sustainable garden is what I called it. And, you know, we all know climate, we're, we're in climate change. It's happening and it's happening fast. And we all know that in the area in which we live, um, there is a, a huge toll being taken on our water supplies and we're not getting enough rain and we're getting too many people using the water we have. And so, you know, we, we end up with um, uh, bans and uh, having to be really careful. Um, so we got to start to learn to adapt. Um, and I'm not saying that we have to grow cacti and, and things like that um, and have it look like we live in, you know, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, um, but, um, and we don't have to plant the same old things that you see everywhere. And, you know, I, I am a plantaholic with, without a doubt. I'm going to hopefully show you some plants that you've not considered. Um, and um, they are drought tolerant, but just so you're very clear on what that means. It doesn't mean you go and you plant it and you walk away. And if it doesn't rain, you don't have to water it ever. No. Um, you have to water um, uh, not so often, but deeply, um, deeply, but infrequently is once things get established, that's the way you water. Um, I also want to talk about something that I um, have um, recently uh, read about, and it says grow it slow. And this is interesting. Fast growing plants use more water than those that grow slowly. So don't rush your plants. I mean, we all are like fertilized, 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 right? Um, if you have good soil, your plants really should be fine on their own. Um, I do like to use organic fertilizers. I like to use manure and compost. Um, but when a plant is actively growing, um, the more they're doing that, um, the more they're gonna be um, having to take more in more water. Um, so just something to think about. Um, and you should minimize your pruning too when it when it gets to the point where it's um the water um uh, water is low, um because pruning is going to make it want to sort of grow too. So that that said, um let's get um going on some pictures here. Um, one of the things that first came to mind to me was you know there especially with all the rain we've had you know that there are going to be places that you see in the kind of wet weather, when we do have wet weather um, that we have um, that are gonna fill up and you're gonna go, oh my God, yeah, it's flooding and you know, it's just low, low area in my yard. And so those are the places where if you have to grow things like a still bee, um, uh, you know, which is this plant in the very middle with the pink uh, fronds, that's a um, ostrich plume, a still bee. 
um, that that's the kind of plant that's going to um, like some moisture. So this garden is a bit sunken in my yard, just a little bit. And um, so and it's also one I can watch because um, I go by it. And, um, but it's by this time is pretty well established. So I don't need to give it a lot of water. There are tree peonies in here too. Um, I don't know if this works for me to do my cursor, but there are um, three, three peonies in here, not in bloom. That happens earlier. They All peonies are quite drought tolerant once they're established. So I'm gonna keep moving on here. Um, rain gardens is something I really don't know much about, but I think they're worth considering researching. And I'm not even going to try to get into it too much. I can just tell you that um, uh, it's a beautiful way to reduce runoff from your property. And it can they can also help filter out pollutants in the runoff and provide food and shelter for butterflies, songbirds, and other wildlife. And it helps divert water in a managed way. Um, so it's not just wasted and runs off your property. Um, so here are some, and I think, I'm sorry, I don't think for sure that I actually, um, uh, that this is in a handout, but I would just look look up some stuff about this. If you're gonna build one, know what you're doing. And if you don't feel like you really know what you're doing, um, get someone to do it that's qualified. Here's a picture of a beautiful, um, it's a very famous um, garden photographer, Rob Cardillo, and he was very nice. He let me use this picture. Those are all Camasia, um, which is a bulb. And it doesn't bloom in early spring, it blooms a bit later. So this is, a moist area. I can see that this is a moist, low area. I can tell by even the things that are growing behind it. Um, so that's, this is on a grand scale, of course, but just to say, you know, this can be really beautiful. It's kind of a wet meadow. Um, so the next one, um, these are, I did touch on some evergreens and I mean, on some um, native things, native plants, um, just a bit. Uh, here's some evergreen natives. Um, that are drought tolerant, um, just two, and I'm showing you their characteristics. Um, at the top, on the left is um, the Eastern Red Cedar, which we see all over the place here. Um, tough plant, tough, tough, tough plant. Um, and um, the berries on top, what they look like, so beautiful. Um, on the right is, um, is a, a holly, um, American holly. This is a very um, sort of well, um, <laughs> well cared for, well coiffed one. I mean, we see them, you know, we're driving through Situ, we see them out in the woods, some um, uh, the West End and stuff. Those are trying to get light from all kinds of directions. They're kind of planted in between, you know, like a beech tree and a God knows what. And um, so they're a little gangly looking, but they certainly can be pruned um, and if um, uh, to be kept in the shape you'd like. Um, and on the bottom, of course, um, you know, I think I couldn't help um, not using this pretty one with the snow over it. Um, so evergreens do look really pretty with snow, um, if we ever get any again, right? All right, moving on. Um, <clears throat> this is just one of, of several, okay? Um, and there's lists all over the place of drought-tolerant native trees. This is a deciduous one. Um, the top left is the flower, which is very insignificant, but it will turn into... Um, a beautiful berry, very almost purple black. And the fall color is beautiful, which you can see there on the left bottom and on the right. It's a large, gets to be a large tree. Um, and uh, black tupelo is what, what this is. Um, and whenever I hear tupelo, I think of tupelo honey, and then I think of Van Morrison, and I'm off and running. Um, so anyway, that's um, that's just one that people don't think about. Um, and it is a native, it's a good looking tree. Um, some shrubs that I like. Now my next door neighbor has the um, uh, Aradia arbutifolia. Um, and um, I love that particular one because it has red berries and um, it's a great um, plant for, um, for uh, pollinators and for birds. Um, she hardly ever waters at all, okay? Um, the difference in our water bills is really kind of pathetic. Um, uh, she hardly ever waters. And um, she's actually teaching me that I don't need to water as much as I used to think I did. Um, but hers do fine. They will take part shade as well. 
It's, a, I think, a very attractive shrub. Um, way over on the right, of course, and I've talked about this plant before. It's something from my childhood. Um, uh, reminds me of my childhood. The scent of it um, is sweet fern, Comptonia peregrina. Um, so there's that. Um, here are some um, conifers that are not natives, but are attractive. And there's millions. I mean, I didn't even know, you know, I just like, well, that's pretty, let me use that one. That one's nice. And I tried to get some variety. So on the far left is a Picea avis, which is a spruce, um, a Norway spruce. Acricona is the um, cultivar, um, nice drapey uh, feeling, very, um, very much a specimen plant. Um, uh, Pinus contorta, um, the variety is latifolia, uh, Taylor's sun, First, is it Sunday? My face is in the way. Yeah. Um, and is the one in the middle. And that gold, those gold tips are what I think kind of, you know, make it extremely special. And um, uh, they do fade as the season progresses. But um, on the far right is Juniperus communis compressa. Whenever you see Juniper, Juniperus, you know it's going to be. Um, uh, very drought tolerant, and there's many, many forms. I, I just thought this was a neat one. Doesn't get too tall. Um, uh, I think it only gets about a foot and a half wide and six feet tall. Um, so anyway, um, not to the next one. We got um, so the the plant in the middle, and I wish the that was a little um, less blurry. Um, but um, it's a, a cornice. Um, Cornus mass, it's also called, uh, Cornus is a dogwood, okay? This does not look like any dogwood you've ever imagined, okay? But it is. And it's also called Cornelian cherry, and it's not a cherry. It is a Cornus. It's extremely early, extremely early. Um, uh, there's some beautiful ones up at um, uh, the Arnold Arboretum. There's a gorgeous one in situate on First Parish Road, not too far from that new um, Roots Nursery um, across the street near Ronnie Shones. But anyway, it's a very cool plant, hardly ever used. It's not super showy, you know. Um, it's um, there's just something I think very very cool about it. It's very medieval, um, and and to the left and right are plants I think look great under and that are early. And I think any of you who would grow hellebores know that they are extremely early. I mean, might have been blooming, starting to bloom for the last two two weeks at least. Um, this sort of eggplant color is stunning under this uh, sort of chartreuse color. And then Cayona doxa or Glory of the Snow over on the right. And, you know, bulbs are so easy once you get them going. I do want to say that bulbs, some bulbs are very um, attractive to deer and bunnies. Um, I use plant skid um, P-L-A-N-T-S-K-Y-D-D. -D. It's not poisonous or anything like that. It's just smells awful to those, to those guys. So, um, cause they really like tulips, really like tulips. Um, and it's very maddening to come out and have them all eaten. But anyway, um, uh, I do plant a lot of bulbs every year. Um, I mean, you know, 400 bulbs every year. It's, it's insane. Um, and what I'm mostly, a lot of that is I'm replacing tulips. However, on the left-hand side here, Tulipa bakeri, um, it's called Lilac Wonder, but I, I, I think it's more pink. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, this is a species tulip. Species tulips are low. Okay, they're not going to be tall, you know, things for, you know, big bouquets. Um, so, but they are much more perennial because it is the species. Um, the further away you get from the species, the more trouble a plant usually is. Um, but these are truly perennial. Um, but um, be careful of things digging up your tulips too, because I had that happen one year. <laughs> anyway, in the middle are Fritillaria meleagris or checkered lily. Um, it's always been one of my favorite plants. Um, it's just, I don't know, there's something just so old fashioned and beautiful about it. Um, those little geometric patterns. That's why they call it checkered lily. And way over on the right is a Salome um, 
Narcissus daffodil. Um, I don't have any of the yellow daffodils in my yard. I only have these with the apricot um, trumpets or I have uh, straight white ones. Um, and that's just my personal preference. The good thing, one of the good things about uh, Narcissus is that they don't get eaten because they're quite poisonous. Um, so uh, let's see, I do like Van Englen and Brenton Becky's for, for buying bulbs. Um, there are other places as well. Okay, so on the on the um, left is a double pink chiffon rose of Sharon, which is not a rose. It is a hibiscus syriacus. And um, uh, there are many different colors. There are singles, there are white, you know, berry colored ones. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of different colors. Um, I have three different colors. This one is my newest and, you know, I just got all excited about this pale pink color. It's so pretty. Um, and, um, and, and they, these are in keeping with the New England cottage style. And they'll also give you some height and also floral um, excitement in the garden. Um, that's a pretty late bloomer. That's August into September. Um, the one at the top uh, on the right is Vitex Agnes Castus. That grows, but they're all sun for the most part, although the um, hibiscus will take a little shade. Um, the Vitex um, or chase tree is um, has a great long history. I'd love to tell you, but I don't have time. Um, and that blooms very, very late. Nice, um, uh, spiky purple, purple color. Um, the um, one on the underneath that, the um, flowering quincer tenomalies, um, that blooms very early. That blooms right around the same time as forsythia. Um, and um, I just thought that color was spectacular. And, and it, this is a range of colors. There's no blues and purples or yellows, really. But there's whites and um, pinks and apple blossom and tons of different colors, red. Um, so, OK, here we go into, I am a big fragrance person. And um, I don't know, I have not met, I should say, anyone who says, oh, I hate the smell of lilacs. Like, oh, what? Um, so these are just three different types. I think the one on this left is Sensation. The one on the right, I'm not sure, but it is a white one, clearly. Um, and I believe the one on the far right is Monge, M-O-N-G-E, I think. Um, uh, there are a few good, very deep, almost red purple ones, and um, that is one. Um, but uh, super, really an easy plant, you know, um, doesn't particularly like real acid soil, but I haven't really found them to be that picky. Um, so, and just prune as, as required. Um, but again, let me just um, stress again that everything needs to be watered, especially the first year or so, um, um, you know, give it ample water. You can't expect them to st be water starved um, uh, when they're, especially when they're new. Um, they'll adapt um, once they're established. So here's a, um, a lilac grove, okay? And I just think I, I could picture, you know, like just sitting in a bench, you know, just amongst these and, uh, or a nice hammock sitting there would be nice. Um, anyway, I had a, um, knew a woman in Situate. Um, she's no longer with us, but she ran a nursery school and she had a, not maybe this large, but a grove of, of lilacs under which she planted Scylla siberica, which there's a slide coming up. It's a very low, very brilliant blue little bulb. And um, it was a literal carpet of them. And she, um, when they were in bloom, she would dig them up, little, just one, one or two, in a little Dixie cup and give them to all the kids at the nursery school. So I just thought it was wonderful. Because um, plants, you know, there's always like cool stories associated with them one way or the other. Um, so here's, um, you know, obviously um, not a fancy garden here, but here it is in mass, um, the um, Scylla. And it's even more blue than, so those are them. Okay, here we have on the left, um, a shrub I, you know, always loved. It's a Daphne. It's Daphne Carol Mackey is the cultivar. It has a lot going for it. Um, uh, it 
is variegated. The foliage is variegated so that even when it's not in bloom, it's attractive. It's got something going for it. Then when it's blooming, which is mid spring, it gets, this is a good picture of it because that is really the color, soft, soft pink like that. Super fragrant, gorgeous fragrance, fabulous. Um, and then over on the right, I think everybody has seen a million of these and it's a classic um, hydrangea paniculata, unlike the um, mop head blue hydrangeas that do need water um, and are often finicky about blooming for us. Um, these paniculatas are tough as nails once they get um, established and um, sort of Victorian looking. Right. Um, here's some other really wonderful shrubs. And on the left is um, Caryopteris clandinensis or Bluebeard. And um, uh, there actually is a pink one now, I think, but I don't know. I think, you know, this blue is just so gorgeous. That's the classic one. And um, blue is very late, August into, you know, early September, I'd say. Um, and uh, I'm a big proponent of blue. And I think a lot of people really do get drawn to blue plants. Um, in the middle is Beautyberry or Calicarpa Americana. Um, again, there are other uh, cultivars of this. Um, there is a pink one, I think, called Welch's Pink that I have not seen yet, but I've wondered about. Um, and I know there's a white one I used to have one in another place I lived. But, you know, look at this color. It's so dazzling. Um, and believe me, this, this, this plant does nothing most of the time, okay, until very late, like October, late October into November, when all the leaves have fallen off and you just see the bare branches with these berries clustered. And then... Um, are great and um, uh, I like them in th at Thanksgiving to bring them in and put them with other um, plants, um, flowers for um, centerpieces and so forth. And then far on the right, two pictures. The first one at the top, this pink one, is a, a close-up of the flower. And then on the bottom is the shrub itself, which is um, beauty bush, not beauty berry, beauty bush, called Witsia amabilis. And it's I guess pretty old fashioned. I knew a lady that had one and I always thought it was dreamy and I hardly, if ever, see it sold anymore. I know you can get them, but um, it's a really a beautiful cottagey um, shrub. Uh, very, very pretty. And it's drought tolerant. Um, Ilex reticulata. Now we drive by and we see them growing in the swamps and yeah, they, they love it there, but they will also do very well um, without a lot of water and hot, dry conditions. I have some red ones, you know, the species in my front yard, the orange one, the uh, winter gold. I have one I've had for years um, on the side of my house. And um, I'm not an orange person, but by that time of year, you know, when everything is done um, and there's nothing clashing with it, I love driving down the street and seeing those bright orange berries. So just, just saying, you don't have to get the red ones. There are other colors. Um, now, roses, um, you know, people think roses, you can make, well, you know, there are some that are, that are pretty drought tolerant. I think generally speaking, they are somewhat drought tolerant. These are exceptionally drought tolerant. Um, I'm just going to talk about the one in the middle, which is a rugosa, super fragrant. It's um, a, a fancy rugosa um, called Teresa Bonnier, I think is how you said. I hate to think that it's actually Teresa Bugnet, so I'm going to say Bonnier. Um, and um, very fragrant and tough. On the two sides are um, Rosa Glocka, also called Rosa Ruberfolia, because it depends on what time of year you're looking at the foliage. I think it's red when it's first coming out, um, and then it gets the blue tint. So even though it's not a showy flower, it's still very pretty. Those pinks against that foliage are beautiful. And they... Um, even when they're not in bloom, the foliage is so exceptionally um, pretty. It's what they call a glaucous foliage. Okay. Um, crevice plants, you know, over in Hingham and Cohasset, there's a lot of people with ledge. Um, and um, these are some plants um, that do well in pockets, you know, little, little space where there's a little bit of soil. And because they don't have, when plants are really short, they don't have deep roots. <clears throat> and um, so, and these are just 
you know, they've been um, evolved to not need a lot of water. Um, our Miriam Maritima or Thrift is the one on the uh, left. Um, Blooms for a very long time. Um, and it, um, what's I gonna say? Oh, it, it, you know, you can deadhead these and they will bloom, they will keep blooming. You can see the little, these little guys just still ready to keep going. So keep it deadheaded and it will look really pretty. On the right is Della Sperma or Ice Plant. I just thought that was a really pretty one. Um, uh, I will tell you that there are differences between ones that are hardy and ones that are not. And I, in some of my resources, there's an article by um, a man I know. Um, uh, he's actually head of Rock Guard Society of America, and he also is like the head guy out at uh, Denver Botanical Garden. Um, anyway, dropping names here, huh? Um, anyway, he, he um, has written a really good article about which ones are and which ones aren't. Um, here's some more crevice plants and, you know, thyme, and they, these will grow between stones, um, you know, stepping stones. They're, this kind, these creeping ones are not super fragrant, so don't be disappointed. Um, you haven't lost your sense of smell. They're not really, that's not really what they're for. Um, you might smell a lot, little bit on a hot day. It's the culinary types that are taller that are the ones that are really um, fragrant, um, have all those um, oils in them. Um, in the middle is Campanula rotundifolia or harebells. And I have seen this growing out of crevices up in New Hampshire um, on the Kangamangas, um, and it really does grow out of cracks. Um, on the right is Obricia. And it's just, you know, it's got sort of a succulenty foliage. Um, you can see it, it's growing out of a crack, pretty purple flower. Um, and that is a spring one. Um, I'm gonna talk about annuals a little bit because there are so many more annuals that are exciting than what we tend to usually see at most garden centers. Um, although the two on the left here, they, you, you can find them, um, Evolvulus, blew my mind. I love the name. Um, and this is not the best picture. Um, I have this growing. Um, I didn't find a picture of my own, but I have it growing in that top area where it's very dry, where a lot of my times are. And um, it blooms all summer. Yeah, it looks great. Middle one, Verbena bonariensis. Um, uh, fall kind of looks like purple polka dots. Um, we'll self-sow a bit. Um, the California poppy way over on the right. Um, the orange one is the species, and they have come up with some other ones that are some interesting colors, maybe not quite as um, easily self-sewing, but um, um, I do go for some of those other colors. Uh, very easy by seed. Cynoglossin, Amabile, you can do by seed. I love blue, so there it is. It's not, it's a bit like a um, forget-me-not, but taller. Uh, the Cerinthi Major, or Honeywort, one of my favorite plants. It's all about the colors on the bracts and they really do look like that. Um, really nice and um, kind of drapey in a container. Um, or Oregonum Kent Beauty is an um, ornamental oregano and those are bracts. The flowers are inside, very great. Um, you can get that. That is not so hard to find, um, so. Um, the two, Photos on the left side, the left in the middle are my front yard. Um, and things have changed a little bit, but I just wanted to point out that there's lavender, there's thyme. Um, you can see the rose there um, is, you know, pretty happy. It's just very dry up there. Um, the, there's another um, section to this garden that is lower where the stone, below the stone wall. So you see a hydrangea, you know, macrophylla down there which of course does not like it dry, that's in shade and that is lower down. So um, anyway, that, so there, I'm just showing that there are some plants up here that are dry plants. Um, and I know there's some other plants that I um, have up there. I have verbascum, which is not in bloom at, the at this time. Um, and that'll sell so a little bit. Um, uh, blue perennial flax, linum perenn, um, Dunce's caps, which is a kind of a succulent. It's a very fun one. And Dianthus, you just can't really see them at, at this point. Um, over on the right is a hot driveway garden that I installed for a client down on Third Cliff. And 
there's yarrow, there's um, there are roses, there are um, two kinds of yarrow actually. Um, there are um, what else? Um, oh, those daisies, um, the banana cream daisies, which are like a Shasta daisy, and um. Alyssum, the, or Lobularia, which is an annual, and um, Salvia caradona, which all the salvias are really tough when it comes to drought. And then I did put a morning glory in there that this was garden was brand new. You know, I just finished it. Um, so it's not doing anything yet, but they are actually fairly drought tolerant. So, um, okay. Um, this is just a nice collection of plants. And you know, all of these are written, uh, I'm gonna maybe speed up a little bit. All of these plants are written on your handout, okay? Under the, the um, number of the, of the slide, but just, it's a nice mix, okay? The only thing that is a um, uh, annual truly is the um, Nicosiana Lingsdorfii down here that I popped in, um, but I just thought the rest of these, you know, some really long blooming, great pollinators, you know, um, so um, here's another one. So things, some things that people don't think of, verbascums, and I mentioned that a minute ago. There are lots of different kinds, um, and I think they are way underused. Um, they're a bit short-lived perennial, but they will self-sow, and maybe you want to collect some seed, um, but lots of different colors. Um, the top, um, that perennial geranium is Roseanne, and Really, all of the geraniums are pretty um, drought tolerant. Um, the macrorhizum or the uh, big root geranium is particularly so. Um, uh, down the bottom, that hazy kind of blue gray color is um, sea holly. And this is a picture in Hyde Park in London. And um, it was a very dry garden. Um, the whole thing is a dry garden. Um, and that's it in mass. And it is just a great, you know, I've used that many places. Um, for, um, you know, sunny, sunny, um, or seaside or any of that. On the far right is um, uh, Jupiter's beard or Centranthus ruber. And I loved when my mother said the word Jupiter's beard, I just loved to even think about what Jupiter's beard would look like, um, you know, Jupiter himself with his beard. But anyway, I love this plant. I love the color. It's highly underused. It's a little finicky. It's one of those things that grows in England and likes a chalkier soil. So you might want to give it a little lime because we're at naturally acidic. So that's sometimes a problem with plants that you, you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't do well for me in drainage, drainage, drainage. You know, these, these, a lot of these um, plants that like it dry cannot sit in cold, wet winters. Um, so <clears throat> salvias across the board, fabulous drought tolerant plants. Not going to talk too much about these. They're on your um, on your sheet. The one on the left is a perennial, Caradona, which I've talked about, and the other two are annuals of different heights, <clears throat> and um, they are just, you know, the the hummers. My God, the hummers absolutely love um, the um, salvias. Okay, um, silver foliage plants are huge. Anything that looks like it grows in the in the Mediterranean, which these types of plants do, um, the reflective, <clears throat> they um, the foliage is reflective. Sometimes it's small. Um, that's another trait um, that keeps them not needing a lot of water. <clears throat> so on the left is Dianthus. That's another one that really doesn't like acidic soil. Um, Stachys byzantina or um, lamb's ear without the flower. I don't. We, People have pretty much moved away from that old fashioned kind <clears throat> and lavender, which of course is incredibly fragrant and wonderful. But again, none of these want to be wet. So iris, um, a lot of iris, except Japanese iris are fine with some drought. <clears throat> Excuse me. Two on the left are um, uh, Germanicas or bearded iris. Um, I just happened to pick those because I thought they were cool colors together. Two on the right are Sibiricas. Um, and I actually do have the Cote d'Azur I bought um, a couple of years ago. I, you know, 
I think you know by now, I kind of like blue plants. So, um, but, you know, great, great plants for um, uh, drought tolerance and for cut flower and later on just for some nice strappy foliage. Um, I know some people like hot colors, you know, and so I'm putting them in here. And if I were to have a hot garden, which, you know, sometimes I kind of wish I could put one in, but I, I don't have any space here um, and it would mess up my color scheme. But um, Nephophia, which is also called red hot poker or tritoma, and there's a few different varieties and colors of them, a uh, great late long blooming perennial has to have incredibly good drainage. It likes it hot next to, you know, a patio, whatever. Um, and then the globe thistle, which is not so fussy. I love that plant. Uh, my mother grew that. And then um, and it cools down the hot colors. It gives good contrast. On the right is a um, type of lantana. I just thought these all looked really cute together. And that's an annual, of course. Um, so again, here's just a collection of things. On the left is a salvia. It's an annual one. It blooms very late. It's an edible type, even though it's an annual, it's not, you know, the kind that you put in your, you know, dressing for Thanksgiving, <laughs> but it's a pineapple sage. So it has a pineapple-y flavor. It's delicious. Pythonia um, is a, a Mexican sunflower, it's called. Um, I think there's a little bit of a, um, a color thing going on with the foliage here. I, I don't think it's quite that blue. It'd be nice, but I don't think it is, but it's still a very handsome plant gets quite large, you've got to have room for it. Um, and, um, you know, just keep it deadhead, it'll just keep going all summer. And then moonshine, Achillea or yarrow is a perennial. And I thought that was a nice um, group of hot colors. Um, Begonia angelique is really hard to find. And I looked and looked and looked and looked. And they, there may be some out there, um, which I'm sure I'll find out after I finish all this. Um, that there are some other um, shade annuals that will take dryness. Um, so most of my shade annuals tend, tend to go into pots anyway, where it's much more controlled. Um, it's not such a big deal if you have to come out with a watering can to do a, um, a container. But, um, uh, you know, things like uh, impatience and stuff are not, you know, a lot of the um, annuals that are for shade are, are just not drought tolerant. But I do love um, this kind of begonia, but I only like it in a container. And there are other colors. I think it's very elegant. It looks like roses. Um, so on the left, it's a weird angle, but it's another container. It's a cement container that sits next to my driveway. Um, and there are perennials in it and annuals. There are two, as you can see, heuchera, you know, the gumdrop, silver gumdrop. There's dichondra, which is the silver plant and that trails beautifully. And then in the middle is a hot pink begonia. So um, in the in the middle slide is um, the verbena bonariensis again. Um, the bonariensis part comes from um, Buenos Aires. Um, that's how it got its name. And it, it is loved by butterflies. And Cosmos is an annual that will take, once you, know, you get it going, um, will take some uh, drought and I was kind of smitten with these little cupcakes and saucers. Um, so I actually ordered some of those. Um, and then the Gora, which a lot of people love, is a, a great um, dry, likes dry, good drainage, very airy. Um, here's some native perennials for sun. Um, um, Allium cernua, which will actually take some shade. I just happen to think it's a very, very beautiful um, native allium. Um, and it is called... Um, What's it called? I'm not drooping allium. Oh gosh, I can't think of it. I'll think of it in a minute. Um, uh, anyway, um, Achillea millifolium is, um, uh, trying to see if I can find that. I can't find it. Anyway, um, the Achillea, Achillea millifolium on the right is um, the native type is the white one. Um, there are white ones that are also cultivars, but we do have a white one. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, nodding onion, that's what it's called, nodding onion, because it does nod over. Um, so those are two um, uh, native perennials that I like quite a bit. 
Um, here are some <clears throat> native uh, perennials that are, um, you know, I've actually seen, really seen. So they're ones that um, do grow in New England. Um, the uh, Asarum canadensis, the um, uh, wild ginger. Um, the European ginger is much glossier than the, than the native one. And the bottom is the flower, which is blown up. It's not that big. Um, not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's nice to know it actually has, but it's always underneath the leaves. Um, uh, Tiarella cordifolia, that's what it looks like in nature. I mean, you can buy them, but they don't really look like that when you buy them. Um, I don't know if those are cultivars or what, but, um, and both are pretty. But um, down the bottom here is um, Christmas fern, one of my favorite ferns and also extremely tough. Um, and then two asters, which no longer are called aster, at least um, botanically. Eurabia and Symphotrichum are the two, Eurabia divaricata on the top and Symphotrichum cordifolium on the bottom. Um, they're both wood asters, white and blue wood aster. And I'm sure you've seen these growing. So those are some good ones. Nice local plants. Um, other plants for dry shade that are not native and which I think everybody knows, hosta, hosta, hosta. But if you have deer, I don't know what to tell you. Um, you got to figure out a way to not let them eat it. Um, and then according to um, Epimedian expert, Karen, Karen Perkins, um, who um, I actually know, have known for years, she's um, uh, uh, said that these three, um, sulfurium, which I have, huge clumps of orange conigan whirliancy and peril chicum from lighten i don't know if that's right um those are good drought, drought tolerant ones i used to be under the impression that all epimedium were and that is not the case so there are probably more you know i know the rosium tends to be um drought tolerant too and that and the sulfurium are quite easy to get um so and you know they're they're showing up some interesting ones at at, at nurseries, but be sure they're if you're looking for drought tolerant, be sure the ones you're buying really are. It's just a little combination I thought would look cool together. Um, Cucurella or a tiarella would look good with this um, Ophiopogon nigrescens or black mondo grass. Um, if you ever seen this plant, it's so interesting. One time I saw a picture of white birch. A little group of white birch, completely underplanted with this um, uh, black mondo grass. It was spectacular. Um, and as we get warm, it will be easier to grow something like this. It doesn't want to be wet in it, you know, right near the edge of a little stone thing is probably a good place. But I think we're it's getting so we're not having as much difficulty as we used to growing a plant like that. Um, here's some great things for the garden. On the left are different kinds, and there are many more, different kinds of opium poppies, um, Papaver somniferum. And um, I grow a few of them. Um, and um, I'd like to grow everything, but I don't have room. Um, really quite easy by seed. And usually once you get them going, you'll, you'll keep having them. You just keep throwing the seeds around. In the middle, <clears throat> Um, so that's an annual. In the middle is another annual called um, Nigella Damascena. And it's also called Love in a Mist, which is a beautiful, beautiful name. Um, it's blue. Uh, and it um, is sort of a signature flower for me. I, I absolutely love the plant. And I actually wore it in my hair for my wedding. And the bottom is a little bit of pink um, perennial geranium. I think it's... Um, I can't remember which one it is. It'll come to me. Anyway, um, uh, um, on the right are hollyhocks. They are really a biennial, but if you cut the flowers stalks down before it really goes to seed, so right after it's done blooming, cut it, it can act quite perennial. Um, otherwise, it is definitely going to be a biennial. Um, and at the bottom, I believe there are larkspur, uh, which is a another annual that's like a delphinium. Okay, I'm getting there. Um, seed, um, sedums, um, this one is, I should have written these on the thing. I hope they're on your um, list, but um, that's Angelique, Angelique 
no, Angelina, Sedum Angelina, the gold one, Sedum Vitakensi, um, at the top, which does flower and gets a really pretty like raspberry pink flower. They're both quite low and they look nice together. Um, on the right is Color Guard Yucca. Uh, lower left is um, um, Penicetum allopecuroides. Uh, next one, the blue uh, spruce is Montgomery spruce and doesn't get too tall. And then again, another um, holly. So my idea here was for these would be great plants to use around a contemporary um, uh, building. Um, um, you know, in my yard, and this is my yard, um, this is against the back of my garage here, um, and then a close-up of a poppy um, called Lauren's Grape. You can see the seed pod. And when that seed pod gets completely brown, and you can shake it and hear the seeds inside, just throw them around, you know, and you'll get some. Just don't dig around. And you, never dig in your garden too early. Don't dig. Um, you know, don't flop that soil all around. You're going to um, dislodge some tiny, cute little things. Um, so here it is on the right. And at the forefront is the Carol Mackey Daphne, no longer in bloom. Um, I've got hellebores no longer in bloom. The blue spruce, I do have delphinium, which are not drought time. I've got roses. I've got poppies. I've got iris. I've got a bunch of things that are pretty self, um, pretty drought tolerant. And I, some of the annuals, the cool annuals that I buy, um, some of them do um, self sow. And again, you got to wait a bit um, before you pull things up, and they'll bloom later. Um, but yeah, um, I actually these are the kind of colors that I that I prefer. Um, so you can always spot water. You can have things mixed up, you know, um, but, um, you know, you don't have to throw the sprinkler on. It's going to water everything. Just go around and go, oh, you know, I know the Delphinium probably wants a drink or this needs a drink. You don't have to, um, you know, blanket water everything. Um, just another, you know, look at some ornamental grasses. Um, it's a native one, um, the blue stem on the left, the fescue, blue fescue on the in the middle. Um, and another another shot of the penicillin. And there's a bunch of different uh, types of penicillin you should know. Um, there's a lot of really great looking ones. Um, this was when I first started this, I wanted to find a picture of a garden that was truly a drought. Everything was drought tolerant. And this is one in England in Cambridge. And I started to think, oh yeah, but it's England. They probably get some rain, a lot of rain. And then I found out that this place is um, one of the driest places in the UK. Um, so um, there you go. Um, a lot of really cool plants. And um, if you look this place up, you will find more uh, um, information about them. It is the Cambridge Botanic Garden. I think that might be on one of the handouts, but write that down otherwise, because um, it is a, a really, they were so nice to me. And um, they they really work. They don't. It only relies on rainwater. Okay, that's amazing. All right. Um, so here's some resources and books and magazines and different things, articles, uh, places I like to buy plants, especially ones that are focused on um, uh, drought tolerant. And remember, bulbs go dormant. So they're there in the spring. It's wet. You don't have to worry about them. And then by the time it starts to get a little nerve wracking with the water, they're they're on their way underground and they'll be fine. Um, and I'm I think this um, I think these are hopefully on your um, but you might I'll just run through this and just make sure you get drought tolerant things. Um, a lot of choices. Um, uh, transplanting. Uh, be careful with that. Um, um, and um, don't do it, don't plant and transplant when it's hot, you know, do it on a yucky day, early or late in the season. Um, mulch around your plants. Um, uh, and there's that big thing about leaving the leaves, which, you know, I have a little trouble with because I like to be really neat, but I did leave them on all winter. Um, 
water deeply and and not a lot. Don't water lightly all the time. You're never going to get a good root system. Water in the morning or early in the evening. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yep, just water according to what is needed. Um, build up your soil. Um, some things really need, will need more moisture retentive um, uh, material. Um, get a rain barrel, use soaker hoses, um, grow plants where it's the correct place. Um, this thing about drought tolerant plants are pros at pulling water from other plants so they'll likely win the water war. Uh, that's a little nerve wracking. I haven't noticed that that being a really huge issue, but it could be. Um, and again, you know, when you should do your transplanting. Um, as a rule, native plants are more adaptable, but that doesn't mean every native plant is going to be drought tolerant. Um, and finally, um, mini witoni is um, a Lakota phrase that means um, uh, it, it's about the Native Americans and their um, uh, protests um, for the, um, at, at um, what is it called? The Rock Place. Uh, yeah, Standing Rock, um, when they were protesting. And what they believe is water does not only sustain life, it is sacred. And they were going to um, redirect the water and um, leave it um, impossible for these people to use to use their water. Um, so um, I thought this was a really beautiful uh, photo. Not sure where it is, but um, I love the moss and the ferns and everything else. And um, with that, I will say good night. And I hope I haven't gone on too, too long. And I'm ready to answer questions. So thanks okay. for listening. Okay, we've got a few questions. Happy to learn about plant skid. Do you have experience with it on veggie gardens or do you have other ideas for the rascally rabbits? Yeah, silly rabbits. Um, that's what I have trouble with because I don't really have deer where I am. But um, uh, I don't grow a lot of vegetables. Um, I will I will tell you that I, I was growing on uh, one of those little yellow yellow tomatoes that are so sweet, you know, the little gold tomatoes. I can't remember what they're called. Anyway, um, and I was looking out my window one day, something caught my eye and my tomato plant was rocking back and forth. Okay. And I'm like, okay, it is not windy. It's the middle of the summer. There was, um, wasn't a rabbit. It was a, a, a chipmunk was climbing up my tomato plant and I was wondering why it wasn't producing. Well, it was, it was just being eaten. So to answer your question, plant skid will work on any plant, okay? It will. Um, I just hadn't thought about using it out there because um, I'd never had anything eating that stuff. I actually have those in my, in my herb garden. I don't grow a lot of veggies. Um, but the nice thing about plant skid is that it's, it's not toxic or anything. It just smells in a way that they don't like it. It does smell bad. And I, at a certain point I in the summer, I like to use the granules, but sometimes I also like to spray as well. The granules last longer, um, but they don't get on the um, foliage. So, yeah, but you, it's fine. They're not, it's not poisonous. So it's fine to use pretty much on anything. So that's that's that. Is there an easy way to separate iris? They're not hard to separate, actually. Um, the best way to do it is kind of dig them all up. And then sometimes, I mean, I'm not all fussy and with them. I mean, I'll just pull them, you know. And you, what you want to do is you want to get rid of what's in the center because that's the oldest and is not going to bloom as well as some of the newer stuff growing on the outer edges. And um, you can kind of just, you know, yank them apart. But if you don't feel like you can possibly do that, take a sharp knife and do it that way. I hope that helps. They're not, they're not um, delicate plants. Okay, um, someone asked if you could repeat the name of the chipmunk deterrent. It's the same deterrent for everything. Um, it's called 
plant skid. However, I will tell you, and I, I'm a little hesitant, but I'll say it anyway. Um, I had one year, um, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I had these um, beautiful um, apricot colored um, species tulips under my birch trees. And um, I was excited. And, and my one of my friends said, hey, you know, some of them are like on the ground. I go, oh, those damn rabbits, you know? And then I the next day, all of them were on the ground. And I went over to look and it, they weren't being eaten. That was what I suddenly realized. I go, they're, they're on the ground, but they're not eating them. So what's, what gives? They were dug up and they were dug up and the bulbs were eaten. And that was chipmunks or squirrels. So the next year when I planted any new bulbs that might be, you know, tasty to those kind of guys, I planted them with um, red pepper flakes. And then a good friend of mine said, oh my God, it will kill them. And I thought, I I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I'd hate to think I was, I haven't seen any dead chipmunks in my yard. Um, so I don't think so. And I think they did take one bite and then go, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You know what I mean? So I'm just saying that it has worked for me. It has worked for me. I've and also I, I, heard of planting them in cages or oh, yeah, but, mesh. Does that work? Yes, but do you know how many bulbs I plant in the start every year? I mean, I'd be, I'd be, you know, out there, you know, on New Year's Day still planting bulbs. I, I couldn't possibly, um, yeah, if you don't have a lot. Okay. You know. Um. The next question is, can mature holly that is too big in front of my house be transplanted? That's anybody's guess. And when you say mature, uh, you know, how, how big are we talking? I've seen them transplanted. Um, uh, one of my clients, you know, I was like, just throw them away. Oh, no, I'm going to transplant. And they did live and he transplanted them. And I was like, whatever. Um, yeah, we were redoing an area, and um, I remember another person I knew transplanted them, and I, I can't remember how the, how well they did. Um, that th sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth, and especially if if it's not anything that's um, super unusual and rare and special. Um, it's more trouble than it's worth, especially given that it might not make it. And then you've gone to all that trouble and, you know, you might as well have just bought a new one. So that's my feeling. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you if you want to risk it. Let's put it that way. And certainly make sure it's good and wet, that the roots are really wet, um, uh, you know, before you dig it up and that you've dug a hole for it to go into before you put it in the hole and, um, you know, keep it watered well enough and hope for the best. Um, okay, someone just said the repellent is spelled P-L-A-N-T-S-Y-D-D -D, and they- S-K-Y-D-D. -D. Okay, and they bought it off Amazon. Yeah, you can. Um, okay. It's less money there than it is some places you know to buy it like in a store it's still not cheap i can tell you that um and but it's of all the ones i've used it's been the most effective okay the next person says i have hellebores in pots when should i plant them outside <sighs> you know i as a rule as a rule i don't plant until um uh you know like mid to late April, okay? Um, hellebores you probably could do before that, um, but, you know, and I've been seeing them places for sale because um, people, you know, want them and, um, yeah. And I'll tell you another thing about them. They say don't transplant them um, in the spring, do it in the fall. And one time I was moving and it was the spring and I was like, I am taking that baby with me. And I dug it up and it, I actually divided it. And it was fine. So they're not quite as um, delicate as as some people might tell you they are. Um, the same with peonies. Oh, don't, you know, don't plant, you know, 
and I've done it. I've I've moved them when they say you're not supposed to. As long as you're careful, um, it's it's not so bad. So um, yeah, I mean, I would wait. You know, you could probably stick it outside. It's the the issue is putting um a plant into cold wet ground. You know what I mean? Um, uh, the the roots might rot. That would be my fear. Um, probably not with the hellebore, but it's just not something I've act actually ever done that I've put in anything this early. So I would, if you want it, if you're worried about it not getting, um, you know, enough light or something, you know, stick it outside in a sheltered place until you feel like it's really time to plant it. And remember, don't deadhead your hellebores um, because you'll get babies. And the reason they are so expensive is because they grow so slowly. Um, um, it's, it, they take a long time. So I just, every year or so I buy a couple more, you know, add to my collection. The next question is, do you need to reapply plant skid every time it rains? The, the, the spray one, I think you do. I don't think it really stays on. That's why I do both. Um, and, um, you know, I, I usually just, in fact, I usually just use the, the granules because it's, it's easier. It's less time consuming. You know, you don't feel like your hand's going to fall up because you've been squirting the, the thing for 30 minutes. Um, uh, but again, you know, if they stand up and they bite that delphinium, and, well, they won't do it till delphinium, but certain plants, you know, bite it in half and you're like, oh my God, if I'd only sprayed it, they wouldn't have done it. So I would... I would think about doing both. Um, you know, it's it's a pain in the neck. I mean, I've got bunnies, believe me. I've already, you know, I saw one like two weeks ago. It was huge. <laughs> um, it looks like we have one final comment. Okay. Thanks for the organized resources and all the beautiful options. I can't wait to try a few in my very small space. Well, that's good to hear because I, I wanted to get people inspired and thinking about um, how um, to put these plants together, um, you know. And, you know, people will ask me, how do you know so much? Did you go to school? I'm like, nope. It's just, I've been, I love it. I love it. I love plants. Um, it's what I do, like, you know, all the time. I'm, you know, neurotic. Um, but so the more neurotic you are about it, the more you will know. It's... <laughs> Anyway, right. thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Susan, for presenting. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everyone. Bye.